Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of the ATOA. This is the Artist Talk on Art. This is our 53rd <clears throat> Monday presentation, our virtual presentations via Zoom. We've been a 501c3 and an organization that's been around since 1975, hosting our talks at different locations at the Lower West Side of New York City. Obviously, because of COVID and the inability to gather in person, we are doing these talks now every Monday. This is a little over a year now that we've been doing it, and it has been a windfall for us. An example tonight, Emma Shapiro, it's midnight. It is technically uh, Tuesday for you, Emma. She'll be presenting from Valencia, Spain. And we've had speakers from Hawaii, from Australia, from Southeast Nebraska. That's sort of like Australia in a way. I mean, we've just had people from all over um, and it really has been great. Um, the ATOA, the 501c3, all our talks are free. If you'd like to contribute, you can go on our website or you can reach out to me. Um, all these talks are recorded. We have a YouTube channel. Again, you can find everything through our website and I'll put our uh, website in there in the chat. Um, along the way, if anybody wants to make a comment, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, ask a question or make a comment. I like this to be interactive. I find the questions or the comments made, they're always positive and they always push the artist to say something that's very interesting. So I, I, I like how our group has been both supportive and offers questions that are sometimes technical and sometimes aesthetic. And so we welcome all that. And again, like I always say, and I, for those who come regularly, I'm a bit redundant, your most valuable thing is your time and all of you coming and spending your time with us means a lot. We are artists talk on art. We only exist when artists talk on art. And so you're all playing a part. We've grown a nice hive, a nice clan of artists that have come together. And all I'll say, if you enjoy what you see, spread the word, tell your friends. If you're not on our mailing list, throw it in the chat or reach out to me. Again, through our website, you can see it all. Tonight, we have three artists presenting. Even though it's only three, we're guaranteed to go over. I don't think we've ever gone under, but I will try my best. We have Emma Shapiro from Valencia, Spain, Jessica Krauss-Smith, and also Susan Kaprov. I think we're in for an exciting time. Last week's talk was quite a brilliant talk. We had a group of photographers uh, that was organized by Susan Tiffin. And it was really quite brilliant. You can see past talks that you've missed uh, on our YouTube channel. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to start the talk, and I'm going to welcome anybody to jump in with questions while the presenters present. And of course, after they're done presenting, you can ask questions or make comments. You'll notice I will uh, read comments off the chat. Uh, it's a nice way. Most of us maybe do or don't know how to use it, but it's a nice way to make vocal the thoughts that we have. So we're gonna start with Emma Shapiro. I wanna welcome Emma. And this is an example. If anybody here ever wants to present, feel free to reach out to me. I often just look at my Facebook feeds, my Instagram feeds, or my LinkedIn feeds. I have large networks of artists I don't know. And Emma's an example of that. I saw her work and I was very happy with what I saw. I reached out and she's agreed to present. So I thank you, Emma for your time and I do look forward to your presentation. I, I know what's coming. So welcome and uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and jump in, feel free to just do as you like and do your screen sharing. Thank you, Emma. All right, well, thank you, Barry. It is a real pleasure to uh, be doing this. I am I'm American, but I live in Valencia, Spain. I've lived here for about three years now. And um, yes, it is tomorrow here. <laughs> But I'm really excited to be presenting my work to you all in New York. It's a real great way for me to touch base with home. I lived in New York for about six years, uh, right before I moved here to Spain. So um, I am going to share, I'm going to try to share my screen. I want to make sure that this works. Let's see, desktop. Okay. Sorry, excuse me for a second. And okay, um, so I uh, excuse me. I am my I am sort of like 
in the thick of it these days with my artwork. And so it was really difficult for me to, to choose which pieces to show you really, but um, I hope I kind of created a, a sort of trajectory of how I see my practice at the moment from beginning to now. Um, so I consider myself a um, multimedia artist. I use layered video projection, collage, self-portraiture and activism in my work. And I always use my own body. And uh, this, to uh, introduce myself from the very beginning, let me make, oh, maybe, okay. I attended university at the Rhode Island School of Design. I studied painting, but I, in the end, I felt like painting wasn't really my language, so to speak. So when I graduated, I was pretty exhausted and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I moved back to my hometown of Alexandria, Virginia, where I had originally attended art classes at the Art League School at the Torpedo Factory there, if anybody's familiar. And I entered that environment, kind of wanting to touch back to my roots, get back into the art that I loved after my contemporary art education. And I couldn't find uh, a job there, except for they were hiring art models. And I'd never modeled before in my life, but I had been comfortable with the environment of drawing models, so I knew it was a safe space. And so I began modeling for the Art League School in Alexandria, Virginia. Pretty soon I met some professors who taught the Art Students League of New York, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. I moved to New York City and ended up modeling full-time for, uh, for about five years. Uh, full-time meaning uh, three classes a week in various artist studios at the Art Students League of New York and other institutions often seven days a week for five years. Uh, this is just some of the examples that I keep of work that was done from me. My modeling experience would end up being probably one of the most important experiences of my life. Um, the way that I was able to understand my own body after many, many years as a very uncomfortable teenager in my own body, uh, comparing myself to others, dealing with just a lot of self-esteem issues related to how I looked, ultimately only seeing myself through what, how I thought other people saw me. Modeling gave me another way of seeing myself uh, in a timeless, more ephemeral way. And it really liberated me, um, as easy as it is to say that. It had nothing to do with the nudity aspect, really. It only had to do with the way that um, I was entering into the canon of art history. So after many years of, of modeling, I eventually at the Art Students League of New York also became a teaching assistant and taught some classes as well and uh, ultimately became the model coordinator for my last year in New York there at the Art Students League of New York where I could advocate for other models and that was very important to me. But while there, I started my first body of work outside of school years later, which was called, which I call the enactments, which are performative, um, they're a performative events that exist in an ephemeral sense in detritus, um, where I move my body through powdered charcoal on paper. And in these pieces, which are only documented in photographs, later I figured out how to preserve some of the pieces, but that took a whole other process. Um, these, these pieces are about how I was connecting to my body at, my, at that time and how I saw my own body as a vessel for my own ancestral history. Um, on my mother's side of my family, uh, much of my family was lost to the Irish famine and immigration to the United States. And on my father's side, much of my family was lost to the Holocaust and pogroms in Europe and Russia. And so therefore I've, I've always felt like I wanted to connect to my ancestors but didn't know literally where to find them. So through modeling, I discovered that I could find them through my own body because that was all, that is what they had given to me. So these pieces are a way of me sort of reburying, lifting, um, and understanding 
what was left from them into my own body. This is uh, one example of them being set up, how it works. It was laying charcoal down on the paper and then moving my body through it. So it's a, it's a negative process. It is an additive process. Um, so the next phase of my artwork came in the form of self-portraiture. And uh, I like this image because this is one of these moments where I personally really remember starting to break with um, the idea of being the model for other people's work. And I started to understand how I could engage with modeling in my own work. So uh, I'm just gonna flip through a few selected images of my self-portraiture work. Um, I consider self-portraiture as a, as a practice more than a body of work, really. I return to self-portraiture regularly as a way to uh, understand my mind, as a way to understand my process, um, as a way to engage with the environment that I'm in. It takes a lot of self-reflection and stillness and times of quiet, which I embrace. Um, and a lot of these photographs are taken in various places that I've lived in the last 10 years, including New York, upstate New York, Virginia, rural Virginia, and in Valencia, Spain. Emma, how, how are you capturing these photographs? You know, being that you're the model at the same time, are you setting up the camera on a tripod? Um, well, basically, yes. I, uh, but mostly it's just a lot of balancing on books. <laughs> yeah, I think I just bought my first tripod this year, actually. But, um, but yeah, it's a lot of uh, setting up the camera, maybe with a timer and uh, running to, to place myself. Some of them, or probably quite a few of them in, in the long run are stills from video that I would capture. So, um, I'm also going to assume if you were at RISD, you studied a bunch of art history. Um, am I right to assume you're familiar with Eves Klein and other artists that use the body as a paintbrush? Yes, I am very familiar with artists like Eves Klein. And my, my enactments in particular have often been related to Eves Klein's work. And um, personally, I, I, I don't have any reference of his work in my work. I felt feel that he used the female body in a very uh, objective, objectifying way, um, and my work is actually not about objectifying the body at all. And uh, and also his work was very additive. But you know, as we place our work out into the world, we're going to be related to artists that came before us, and therefore part of the conversation. And I welcome that really when it comes to my views on his famous body of work and, and how my work might hopefully maybe create some kind of balance to that or a counter argument. Emma, uh, Francesca Woodman, is she somebody who inspired you? Um, well, yes, I'm very inspired by Francesca Woodman. I, you know, if there are references to her work and my work, it's something that is just sort of deeply emotional and not direct. But we actually, I, I attended the, um, the European Honors Program, European Honors Program in Rome, which a lot of, she also attended. She was a Rhode Island School of Design alumni too. And she also attended that program and was very famous for producing a lot of photos in the same places where I was at that time. So I think that um, emotionally, she does have a big impact on me. Um, and so like you'll see a lot of uh, kind of sensations in my work that are probably like that echo a lot of hers, including um, I feel I see more of her in uh, my collage work, which I'm about to get into as well. So um, in around 2016, I started embracing different kinds of performative collage. And that'll be something that is very, um, present in my work as I see it currently. And these are just a few examples of kind of performative collage that I did in a Xerox bed um, in 2016 or 17. 
at the Vermont Studio Center. And this is where I really started enjoying interacting, encountering my own body in real time. So encountering images of my own body in real time, encountering actions of mine in real time and capturing that moment of interaction. So um, then around the same time, I got my first projector, which uh, is now my favorite, favorite tool. And I, I use a lot of projectors in my practice, though I keep, keep buying pretty crappy ones because I just wanna amass them and uh, I should just save up to buy a really nice one. But uh, so some of these images now are still images from videos of me experimenting with the projector at the time, but I've been interested from the very beginning in encountering my own body in video and projection and interacting with those in real time. So the, the work is not live performance per se, it's, uh, it's video taped live performance, I guess. So here's some still images of me, my first working out of it. And then I'm gonna share with you work that I've made in the last year. I've had a number of great opportunities lately to um, really explore a lot of this work. And so I've really pushed it. This piece, um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the kind of memories that I hold within my own body. So I've done a lot of reflecting on my time as an art model and, and how my body informed my memory. And as I've moved from the United States to Spain, I also wonder what the kind of touchstones I hold um, of my identity are and, and where they come from and how valid they might actually be to me now and how all of that is held within my body. So, and I'll elaborate on that further, but in this work in particular, this is layered projection. So this is a live recording of layered projection and action and where I have been trying to memorize the kind of actions that I took previously and uh, re-performing them sort of for myself and also trying to line up uh, my actions. I noticed when I first saw your work, I liked the layered projections because you, you, you somehow distill time and you create a different sense of time um, when you do that. It, it uh, I don't know, it's very interesting and very moving. Thanks, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I'm getting more, keying in more into the yeah, time. And I like with working with layered projections, you're get, you, there's different time loops that happen within the projections. So you end up kind of surprising yourself throughout. So, um, this one, oops. This is another, which I call Phantasma. Sorry. And this one, I'm, I'm, I layer, this is a, I think a five or six layer projection. So the, the physical nature of it was deteriorating. Uh, you know, as, as I layer on um, recording and, and playing back, recording and playing back different projections, it starts to evaporate. And I'm very interested in this, um, you know, while I'm, while I'm trying to watch myself, trying to remember the kind of actions that I took before and how to interact mm. with those, I'm disappearing before my own eyes. <clears throat> and that's kind of how I feel I'm relating to my, my memory of myself and, and who I thought I was and, and how that changes while you're doing it, you know, and while you're performing yourself. I do want to read a few of the comments uh, in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Krasowitz says, the self-portraits remind me a bit of Emmett Gowan's portrait of his wife, Edith. Mm -hmm. um, Olga <laughs> Alexander says, I love the collage work. Jenna Lash, you and your figures together is evocative of dreams and personal reflection. 
and I see you shaking your head. That's what you want. And Jill Gerwitz uh, says, wonderful photos, collages, and videos. And I think we all agree. You get something and like these images here, you get what I think filmmakers try and do at their best. And I've referenced Apocalypse Now in the beginning. You get a layered montage where it's not just one image on another, but you have several images moving together. And as a result, you get something more. It's, it's sometimes collage can get you more, uh, it's like a gestalt than the combination of the individual. And by having the breakup and losing certain figures and the coloration wrong, it sort of looks like it's more of the spirit of the real than just the surface of the real. Yeah, I like that a lot. That is, um... can you maybe talk about the technical aspects of the film layer, the film, the video layering? Sure. Um, so I consider my work, like how I use uh, any kind of technical equipment as like basically using scissors. Like it's, I'm not technically apt at all. Um, this is literally me recording something of myself on, on uh, these days I've been using actually my phone to record. And, um, and then feeding that through a projector and recording my interaction with that video and then feeding that through again, recording that. So um, if that makes sense, it's like li literal layers of, of video projection um, just through a loop. That's pretty much, that's a, that's literally it. <laughs> and this, this is, was an exploration of uh, when I started, I started thinking again about, uh, about modeling and, and, um, and what that meant to me and to revisiting that experience in my mind of uh, that experience in my life that was very, very important to me. Um, and trying to think about why, because right now I'm, um, I, I consider myself an activist. I have some very um, strong projects that have to do with uh, censorship and uh, an art and also just uh, censorship with a female body. And I've been trying to explain to myself what it means to me to be a nude model um, and in the, in the history of the male gaze in art um, and, and how I relate to that. So um, I've started to really embrace the idea of, of uh, revisiting my modeling times in my artwork. So and to move on, um, I don't wanna take up too much time. This is uh, one way in which I did this and I'll just jump through it. So these are the, I call these the cutouts and these are literal uh, poses that I took when I was a professional art model. Um, a friend of mine took a lot of photos of me doing some fast poses and I cut myself out of those images and then tried to fit back into them, basically. And um, you know, years later, and uh, revisit these physically actual physical positions I was in, and then layered that video with with further interaction. And uh, as I move the boxes around my screen that's pre-recorded, I, I actually get lost while I'm trying to reenact the poses. So I'm, in, I'm interested in these moments where while I'm performing, so to speak, for my camera, um, I actually do get lost or confused where it's not so controlled uh, by me. And, and I'm trying to investigate that kind of moment further these days. Um, and, uh, these are the, the cuerpas, which is a further project that I've been doing right now, which are those cut out images of myself, the reverse side of those blank white cutouts that you've seen, where I have cut myself into pieces and reconfigured my own body into contortions that are not, um, that are not feasible, but are believable at first glance. And it's my way of explaining to myself how I, have 
contorted myself through my life using this same body, the same sense of self um, to, to fit into whatever situation I find myself. And uh, also uh, Heraclitus comes to mind because you're trying to step back into what you were and you're realizing you can't, you can't step twice into the same river. And yet you're, you're working with it very creatively. That's really interesting, thanks. I'm writing that down. I do wanna read a few of the comments that have come up. Okay. Um, uh, Alyssa Pritzker says, Emma, I hope you're enjoying the essence of Valencia. She lived okay. there for five years in Mallorca and Barcelona and the Mediterranean life left a big mark in my life, Art. How would you say living in Valencia and how long have you been there? How would you say it's impacted you as opposed to being in uh, New York or uh, you know, in the United States? Well, I, I think that I, I feel, to be perfectly candid, like I feel a whole lot healthier here than I did in the United States, uh, psychologically and physically. Um, the, the food agrees with me, the wine agrees with me. And, um, you know, just like the, there's less stress for me here. Um, healthcare not being something I have to overly concern myself about, uh, gun violence not being something I have to overly concern myself about. I, I genuinely feel the lack, I feel the absence of anxiety here. <laughs> what drew you to Spain? My husband is from here. So love. <laughs> A few other comments. Uh, Elaine Forrest says, it raises your consciousness of what a body can do. The movement is elegant, beautiful. Uh, Janet says, great work, Emma, but from Janet and Greg. And Susan Tiffin, and she makes an interesting comment, thinking of Matisse's dancers, the movement, mm. the flow. Yes, thanks for pointing that out, Susan. Regina Silvers, very creative combination of figure, video, collage, fascinating. And I think you hit on something, Emma. You know, you're right, you approached it simply, you're not techno, but you did it in a complex way. Sometimes, you know, whole movies have been shot on iPhones. Today, the technology is there. So just cause you're using what we may say is simple, you're certainly getting the results of a complex image. Um, that does the layering and you're, you're certainly pushing it, you know, in great ways. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm not too interested in learning editing software or anything beyond what I need in the moment because I do feel the tactileness for me is really important. And, and as close as I can get to being tactile, the more, you know, I feel that my, I, I can understand the work myself. Um, I don't want to take up too much more time, so I'm just going to move on uh, quickly to um, a recent video that I made where I'm starting to combine a lot of these um, these recent ideas, and this is called like Cuerpa Memories, and I was working on this, uh, this body of work during, I had a residency with Agora Digital Art, which was a virtual residency, and I didn't consider myself a digital artist. Um, at all until they sort of gave me the permission to consider myself a digital artist. Um, and uh, so during March, I, I did this virtual residency program with Agora Digital Art in London, and that was really wonderful. And this is one, one piece in which that I, um, I started pushing. This, loop, this came out of the fact that I actually don't have a studio right now. And so I built a, a diorama box for myself to start uh, and, and that meant that I started engaging my hands in a visible way, which I'm interested in pursuing. Um, this is the work that caught my eye, the way your hand goes in there. You know, we're looking at those objects and you know, we sort of assume their value and then by you coming in, your scale is much larger and you picking them up, it, it has like a Monty Python feel in the best way possible. Um, and it, it just plays with our sense of reality. And again, 
using a dia diorama box or something simple, you know, those simple things work. Uh, pinhole cameras work. Um, I, I want to point out Carol Arito says fantastic and holographic like. Um, and Alyssa Pritzker, the diorama is exquisite and very telling. And certainly this image where you have all these figures together, it almost draws back to a classical, I don't know if I'm thinking early Renaissance or Renaissance painting, where you have all these figures stacked together. And somehow, you know, it's very contemporary, but at the same time, the sort of collage of many figures draws back to art history in a very contemporary way. I, you know, I want to say things like the rape of the Sabine women or some of these large group shots uh, where somebody has conquered a town and they're having their way. Um, but you, you sort of, you, you get a great sense in your mass compositions. That's, uh, yes, I, that's I want to, oh, I'm sorry, I want to add Emma that the fact that you are removing but the figures are falling it's just that's a it, it's just very interesting the this the movement that you are getting with that every time that you remove one of the figures or two that is another movement inside the movement it's a very interesting work and i'm glad that you're pursuing and you know you. this this avenue that you are getting into thank you I, that that's a it's really wonderful to get feedback on, on this work, you know, it's, uh, we spend so much time looking at our own work and in our own heads and it's just, it's lovely to be able to share it with people and, and to get this feedback. It's, I think I'm gonna use it a lot. Um, well, this is some other recent work. This is about the end. Um, this is a, I've been calling these exquisite cuerpas and they're, um, Well, kind of self-explanatory. There's there's a there's an interesting kind of I know it's a <clears throat> kind of a stretch, but there's a little bit of like a Hans Bomer kind of feel too in some of these pieces. The way that you you kind of <clears throat> break your body apart um, and and reconnect it. I don't know. I mean, of course, that would be the ultimate in male gaze, but but I don't know if that's something that interests you, that, that sort of um, way of reconnecting the body. Well, it's worth taking a look at, I think, you know, I mean, my relationship as, as having a, a female body in relationship to the male gaze and, and that being a, a standard that we're constantly um, dealing with and, and in her history, understanding ourselves through, um, you know, I, I can't help but engage with it and so. It's lovely work. Thank you. Um, so, what is your activism? So, I'm, I'm actually going to explain that now. Um, these are some other videos, but I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, so, my activism is uh, started with this situation uh, in 2017, where I tried to get some images printed at a local Walmart in Virginia, which was my first mistake. And uh, I was very, um, I was told that the work was porn pornographic, that they normally call the police in these scenarios. And I was very um, purposefully shamed in front of other clients at the store. It was a very um, humiliating experience for me. But while I was there, I tried to press them about what about the work they thought was porn pornographic because all I was trying to do was get work printed Living in rural Virginia, I didn't have much access to um, other printing places to get some work printed for me to use in collage work or whatever I was trying to do. And, um, and I was shocked by this response because I didn't see my body as being pornographic and that they considered it to be so. And when I pressed them for an answer, what they told me was, it shows your nipples. So I was uh, dumbfounded and felt really upset, you know, I felt like this, uh, this body autonomy that I had built for myself over the last few years, I had just left New York and I had finally felt um, like I was standing on my own self-esteem and not judging myself through the eyes of others. And, um, and I felt like this sort of uh, jolt of a reality check uh, that I was very unwelcome. 
And um, so that that work then turned into a an online uh, an Instagram account that started by me wanting to then put my nipples everywhere. I created a nipple sticker out of my own nipples <clears throat> and started putting them everywhere. I created an Instagram account I called uh, the project Exposure Therapy. And now the project has reached over 40 countries. It has over 25 different women's nipples from all over the world. And, um, and I've been engaging with a lot of other activists and really growing the project to reflect how, um, how it, that's just this entry point. This ti the tiny thing of a nipple is this entry point in understanding how, um, how the female body is discriminated against on social media and offline. So, and uh, I will be giving a lecture with uh, the London Drawing Group at the end of May about censorship of the female body and artists on social media, and also create doing a panel a few days after that of censored artists and bodies on social media. Um, so that's a something that's happening hand in hand with my artwork. I'm sorry to take up so much time. No, I, I think it's lovely what you're doing. Great what you're doing, because I've often thought about the body and nudity. And now, you know, it's so it's terrible how, how people are stuck and, and we're stuck in these spots like nipples. So when I was a little girl, they used to have I grew up in the 50s. They used to have these little bikinis where you just only had the bottom, no top. I don't know if anybody else remembers those bathing suits. They didn't have a top. And then at one point. I guess when I was about five or six, uh, somehow we had to have the top. And we started wearing the tops. I was shamed into wearing a top. But I never thought anything was wrong with my nipples. But I'm so glad you're doing this. Very good. <laughs> That's exactly it, right? I, we're, we're taught to sexualize our own bodies. And so exactly. that's a habit we need to figure out how to break for society. Yep. Thank you, Emma. Round of applause for Emma. That was a beautiful presentation. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you, you, you also, your work has really evolved. You've done a lot of different things. Each of the individual things you tackled are respectful in themselves from that, how you uh, rolled on the charcoal, those images that you made. I mean, you, you, you hit at least five or six different things in your presentation. And it's nice to see an artist revolve um, and sort of move through. Um, and I, I particularly liked when you had the projection and then you went ahead and you drew around the projected image. That, that gets me, I, I like that trick. Um, I, I do wanna read a few things. Uh, Yoram Gellin, Gelman said, the innovation is impressive, just fantastic. All aspects are great. Um, Larry says, Emma, it is rural Virginia that is the answer. Rural, good work. And you are, you're moving the bar, like going to Walmart and getting that reaction. You know, you, you're, going in, you're going in deep there. You're going to the uneducated America. And so you're sort, of, you're sort of beginning the dialogue from them. But I like how you took that, responded to it, and went with the nipple project. And like you say, 40 countries. You, you wouldn't be able to do that unless you got that negative response. So you somehow, you really worked with a negative and turned it very positive. Um, and that, take, that takes guts. Uh, Gloria Sampson Knight, children years ago never had a top to their bathing suit. Right. And understand men can show their nipples. Um, and as far as the, the male gaze, uh, years ago when I would go through museums with friends, and I take a look at the Renaissance painting, I was like, this is early pornography. This was done for men. And if you look at the women that were painted, you know, they didn't have photographs. This was porno. I really think a lot of the early Renaissance and the Renaissance work, you know, was for the male gaze. Um, you, Rubens as well, later work, like Baroque work. I, 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 I hate to say it, but a lot, a lot of men were just painting sexual images and you're, you're definitely right. You're so opposite Eve's Klein. Sometimes images look similar, but you are coming, you know, he was basically abusing the model. Like, I don't know if he was swinging them 
to get the hair to do the painting. Makes me think of Degas referring to his the ballet dancers as little monkeys. You know, he was very abusive in his mind of the people he was drawing. You're quite the opposite. You're respectful of the body. You're searching. And I also like the vulnerability you're expressing. You don't know. You're sort of searching for the self. You're in a tenuous position. And vulnerability is important to be able to explore new things. I'll open it up to a few more comments at most, and then we'll move forward. Certainly a brilliant presentation, Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jenna Lash does says, your work shows continual growth. We circle round and come back to the same place, yet, a yet at a higher level of the cycle. Uh, well said, Jenna. And instead of circle, I like to use the word spiral because circle is very two-dimensional, but we spiral. So we come back, but we're at a higher point, so to speak. Um, you, Barry. <laughs> but then... <laughs> we think flat, but very two-dimensional. I am gonna move on, keep throwing comments in. I will read them. Uh, brilliant presentation. Jessica Krauss-Smith, your turn. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, unmute yourself, Jessica, and uh, feel free to screen share and tell us where you're from. And of course, anything about yourself. I do wanna say again, this is Artist Talk on Art. We're here every Monday. We have a few board members with us. Fran Beeler, a member of the board is here. Jacqueline Sararada is here. Mitchell Pilnick is here. It's nice for the board to be a part of this. They do a lot of work behind the scenes to make this and everything ATOA happen. If you ever want to contribute, you can go to our website and see what's going on. You can also see- You forgot me, Barry. Oh, I'm sorry. Again. Fran, I'm yeah. sorry, Francine. Francine is on our, uh, uh, has been a board member for way before I was a member. I'm sorry, Francine. You just keep pointing it out. That's okay. Um, and uh, sorry about that. So uh, anything ATOA, you can find out on our website. And we'll move right along to Jessica. Welcome, Jessica. Where are you coming in from? Hi. Um, I am actually in uh, West Virginia right now. But I am a Brooklyn-based artist. Um, I came here during the pandemic. And I've been floating back and forth um, because I have a little girl who's in remote school. We had no reason to stay in the city. So we've just been floating around. <laughs> floating around. Um, but uh, I have lived in New York for, for about 25 years and I love it there. Let me see if I can uh, see. Get screen share on here. Here we go. Can you see me here? Yep, we can see. Very nice, Jessica. Okay, great. Got it in the size. Now I have a really active Instagram account that I that I love and enjoy um, presenting my work on, but I thought I would do a nice uh, presentation for you all. So you could see um, sort of where I come from and why I make the paintings that I make uh, today. So I'm an intuitive abstract painter. I'm based in Williams Williamsburg in Brooklyn where, where I live and I love it there. I've lived there for about over, over 10 years. Um, my studio is in Greenpoint um, and I've lived and worked in New York for 25 years. I'm also an art director and graphic designer. Um, and uh, specializing in luxury fashion. So I've, that's how I've you know, paid the bills to afford my studio for a long time. And I'm also a photographer, photographer and a mother. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter and a husband and a cat. But uh, this is um, me in Long Island City Art Center um, with three of my more recent works. So you sort of see what I kind of work I do. Um, here is a picture of my painting table um, in my current studio here, my temporary studio. You can see I use house paint and sticks and palette knives and fluid paint and tubes and just about anything I can get my hands on to make marks. Um, I like to use acrylics, like house paint, mixed media on canvas. 
Uh, my work is gestural, intuitive, improvisational, expressive, and sculptural. It all just comes from within. Um, paintings reveal their personalities to me as I work on them, and I title them after I'm done, and I've sat with them for a little while and, and know what sort of what, what they seem like to me. Uh, their meaning is also open to interpretation depending on what the viewer sees in them. I really love how it's like a Rorschach test. Everyone sees something different uh, in, in these abstract paintings. Um, I strive to create harmony in my work no matter how chaotic they get. And often it's a really wonderful challenge to get the balance right and know when the work is actually done. Sometimes it can take just a small yellow dot to tell me that, oh, now the work is finished. It's harmonious now, and it wasn't before. Um, here's a picture of me, little me, sitting with my crayon box. You know, I was always a creative kid. Um, I think this was taken somewhere in New Hampshire, but I grew up in uh, upstate New York, near Utica, and I spent summers in Massachusetts near the coast. Um, I was always in my little creative world as a child. I loved art class. Um, my parents sent me to Munson Williams Proctor Institute, if you've ever heard of that, in Utica. Uh, great museum, and they had some really wonderful classes that I took. Uh, I have four siblings, but I am a twin, and I'm the eldest uh, fraternal twin sister who is a uh, neurology researcher, so she's a scientist. So we, were, <laughs> we, we really, you know, went opposite ways, which was always fascinating to me. I thought, here's my twin, and we're literally like, you know, yin and yang here. Um, Jessica, let me ask you, I always like to ask this question. Yeah. You have a picture of yourself when you were younger. When you were younger, what were the subject matters that you drew? What were the themes? What were the things? Does anything stand out? I don't know, actually. I knew I would draw objects. I love to draw things a lot. Like I would draw toy horses. Um, I'd love to set things up and then draw them like make little still lifes. I also had a little uh, tiny camera and I take my stuffed animals and set them up in still life arrangements and photograph that. So I was just very into sort of um, objects at that point, if I remember correctly, more so than people, you know. <laughs> um, Thank you. So uh, let's see. I had a couple of influences in my family in terms of art. This is my father's needlepoint work. Uh, he's a doctor, but he needlepoints all the time. And I was always watching him do this work. Um, he loves this really intricate stuff. And so I would watch him go through and complete all the work that he loves to do and his needlepoint as he's talking to us. Um, another influence uh, in my life is my grandmother who was in, uh, lives in Manhattan, or, and she passed away, but she lived in Manhattan. She was a very sophisticated, wonderful lady. We were very close and she loved to do, she did still lifes and I loved her still lifes and I inherited this one. Um, I loved her use of color and that they were in oil and her simple compositions. And she also did portraits. Um, here I am in, uh, at age 15, learning how to paint watercolor outdoors in uh, Little Compton, Rhode Island. My grandfather sent me to a watercolor class one summer and uh, I loved it. And we were, you know, these ladies and I would go and find these beautiful spots and they to teach me how to use watercolor. And uh, I loved watercolor. It was sort of, I loved how it was accidental and it would sort of flow this way and there's nothing you could do about it. You know, you couldn't really control it, but when you could control it, you know, it was a real feat and uh, what a beautiful piece you made. Like here, for example, here's, you know, one watercolor I did. So I was just learning very basic watercolor. <laughs> I always look back at these and smile and say, oh, remember when I did watercolor? Um, then I uh, went to Skidmore College. I was majoring in English at the time because English was the most creative thing my high school could recommend to me to do. Uh, and so I was a, doing poetry. And then I took this 2D design class because Skidmore is a great art school. And uh, I thought, this is it. I love this. I'm majoring in art. Forget this poetry thing. I am moving forward in art. 
Um, and here we go. So these are some charcoal studies, you know, that I worked on. I learned how to figure paint uh, in oil. This is oil pastel on the other side. Um, you know, I did lots of figure painting. I remember in the crit for this piece, this oil painting on the left here, somebody said that color makes me nauseous. And I kind of loved that because that was a real reaction. You know, this is just a figure painting, but that was a real uh, reaction somebody had to the actual color. So that was interesting to me. Um, I got really into Warhol and the uh, um, pop artists. I made this oil painting of my mother, a portrait on the left here. I made a painting similar to Rosenquist style on the right. Uh, so I was doing that for a little while. Then I moved on to something more abstract. This is an oil painting, uh, but you know, the oil paint wasn't doing it for me. It took way too long to dry. Uh, it was just, you know, a little clumpy. The colors weren't as bright as I wanted them to be. And uh, here's my mother and I in my studio in college. <laughs> you can see I'm starting to use some house paint there in the background in those, in those paintings. Then I discovered house paint and I, I was experimenting with it, uh, pouring it over objects and letting it dry. And I was just loving the results. So this is a installation I did called Birthday Madness. And uh, it's literally objects. I would go to like Kmart and just fill my cart with things, bring them back to the studio, start pouring paint over things. There's like curlers in here and wine glasses and installation foam. And I was just really having a great time with the medium. And also I love birthday parties, so. This, uh, this work reminds me of uh, Klaus, Klaus Oldenburg when he had the store, did work not unlike this, where he took real objects, sometimes from the street, sometimes store-bought, and he did similar, you know, similar energy to what you're doing. Very nice work, very smart. Thank you, I love Klaus Oldenburg too, so. Um, then I decided to translate to Canvas. And this was a piece I did for my senior show where I actually, um, it was called, If Nothing is Concealed, Nothing Can Be Revealed. And it was about the three, part, three parts that people look at in women, uh, the sexual part, which was red, uh, the part that raises children, which is yellow, and the domestic part, which is the blue. So this was my statement about what people uh, think women should be doing, because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, I'm going to do a lot more than that. Um, but these are, this is how you can see the way I would attach objects with the house paint to the canvas. And I took Polaroids of myself, you know, and with lipstick and put them in here. Um, a feather boa, there's a dustpan, there's like yarn and uh, rollers and, you know, needle, um, knitting needles. And then in the one in the middle, the yellow one, you can see I had a Polaroid and some, you know, teddy bears and stuff that kids would play with. Um, the yellow one that Skidmore took that one for their permanent collection. <clears throat> and it still lives at the Time Museum today. And I went to visit it the other day, but it's separated from the other two. So it's a little jarring to me <laughs> to see it alone. Uh, then I moved to New York City. And uh, my first studio is down where I worked, which I worked at Paper Magazine when I first came to New York City. Um, <clears throat> and I found this really cute little, not cute really, but little studio right next door. So I would work and go right next door um, and do some painting, but I became very minimal. Suddenly I, I wanted everything to be very minimal uh, and easy, but I was using the house paint. Uh, my next studio was out in Bushwick with some friends and I started sort of doing some more sculptural pieces again. You can see some skate, some I think there's called skate eggs on the right and on the other side I used some plastic Easter eggs and I'm still using the house paint lines. Uh, my next studio and this all this time I'm doing I'm working really hard as a graphic designer coming home late you know going to the studio at night um, <clears throat> was at Rutledge Street in South Williamsburg, which is in the Hasidic neighborhood. And uh, very, very mellow landscapes. You can see I'm just sort of just painting, 
because I love to paint and I'm just, you know, making sort of mentally cleansing uh, pieces. Then I moved to my next studio. Um, before this, I had just gotten married. I moved to London to tour with my husband's band for like a year. It was really fun and great. Then I came back, uh, moved to Williamsburg, found this studio in 708 Driggs, which was an amazing building. I don't know if you guys have ever uh, been there or heard of it, but it had all these artists living in it, um, big loft building on the corner. I started doing these um, brushstroke works with just a little bit of house paint, but very bright colors. Uh, I started doing very gestural, sort of frantic looking work uh, using paint right out of the tube. I like to paint with the actual tube sometimes and just squeeze it out. Um, now you can also see on the other side, I'm using the washi watercolor background a little bit. This is the studio. And I started really working big again, finally, and it was fantastic. I had so much energy in me to create at this time. Here I am painting, um, actually using a brush this time, but I like to paint flat, put the work on, on the table or the floor, and then sometimes prop it up so I can get some drips. Uh, my family started having a lot of children. Everyone started having babies. So I started painting these very easy on the eyes things. Um, I gave one to you know a niece of mine. I sold another one. Um, but you can see my watercolor sensibilities coming through a lot here, which I always use in my paintings. Uh, then I did this bigger piece called Vortex. And I remember using the gold color in the background because I was very inspired by mummies. Uh, like the gold color and the Egyptian, you know, Egyptian mummies. And then uh, I started throwing house paint on the canvas and it was just creating this sort of wild piece, which I ended up calling Vortex. Also in the corner, you can see there's some sculptural paint here. Uh, made this painting called House of Cards, where I experimented with using tape um, and also more mark making uh, with sticks. Uh, a, a new another piece called Festival, which has about 30 to 40 layers on it. And you can see here on the side, I showed you some in progress um, uh, pictures. So you can see some of the painting before it was actually final. Then I actually had a baby of my own. And the, when I was pregnant, uh, the yellow piece on the right was the only thing I painted the whole time I was pregnant. I think they call it maternal preoccupation <laughs> where you can't really do much else. I'm you're thinking about the baby, but I painted one piece and it was for her and it's in her room. It's called Pregnant. Um, this is showing my, uh, a bunch of my work at, that was going into a pop-up show at, on the Bowery in 2014, a couple of months after I had my baby. Um, you can see the scale of the work here. This is a piece called Pendulum, and you can see how it looks in an interior. I've always loved interior design, and I love seeing my work in an interior because it really affects the people that live there. I mean, it's so much energy. This is a painting called Thrive that I did shortly after my grandmother died, um, and she, you know, it's just all about life and living and you can also see in the detail that I was using um, spray paint and some glitter. And uh, you can, I've been adding glitter a lot to my pieces because I just love having elements that are a little bit sculptural that play in the light. This is a painting called Catapult um, that I showed at an ad art show at Sotheby's in 2017. This is in the very corner up here, you can see um, while it's in progress, it was another painting, <laughs> Bird of Paradise, but I never liked it. So I took it back in the studio and worked on it some more and it became this wonderful piece called Catapult. Uh, this is a show I had at the Yashar Gallery in Greenpoint, showing a bunch of my work and this, you can see this sort of the scale and how bright everything is. Now, this is my current gallery in Greenpoint. I'm sorry, studio in Greenpoint. And you can see my work table is there. And uh, 
I've got a bunch of my paintings up and it's, it's, a, it's a small space, but I make it work. Um, and it's been great for me. There's a painting of mine in my current studio space. The painting is called Beautiful. Uh, it's, and it's very, this is, this is one of the hardest paintings to make because every, every line was so important that I would, I didn't know exactly how it was going to look, but I had to take chances with every single line and I just wanted it to be so floating and so look so effortless. Um, and I was very thrilled with how it came out. I do want to say, Jessica, you work very well with black and it's very hard to work with black because it's very dominant and somehow you integrate it, but of course it stands out. I remember when I saw your work uh, online, some of your work approaches Kandinsky's work around 1914. You get that sort of, uh, you create depth with your colors. There's a good push pull, but there's just a sense of beauty uh, in the work. Um, let's see. Uh, Lawrence Wheatman says, even your early works were wonderfully detailed. The ones that you showed and life, it is beautiful. I mean, I think that that summarized, I think uh, maybe what you're trying to achieve and you, you do mix textures uh, that normally and gold as well can be very tricky to work with. It, it too can stand up and fight with things. Um, mm -hmm. Susan Tiffin says, love your paintings. Do continue. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Yes, I mean, uh, thank you for the comment about the black as well, because it is so dominant. And one of my challenges has always been to make a truly black and white painting. And I, I can't, I still haven't been able to do it successfully because I always just want to add some sort of color somewhere. So if you ever see me do that, please give me a round of applause <laughs> successfully. <laughs> uh, here's another piece called Nest that has to do with family pretty much. Um, there's three, there's a yellow piece of plastic on the bottom there and uh, two stripes of glitter and that represents my husband, me and my daughter. So I kind of I like to, I like to call that one nest. Uh, here's nest on my Brooklyn rooftop. I like taking my paintings out of the studio, sort of into the wild and um, seeing how they sort of interact with the environment. And I, I just love New York City. I love all the street art. So inspired by it. Love the tear torn subway posters. You know, I just, everything just speaks to me there. And it's uh, so exciting. Um, Olga, Olga Alexander points out they are infused with a sense of play. I can see these with the poured sculptural pieces, which are wonderful. Um, and Anne Leith points out, I like the spaces uh, between. And that is important. I often liken uh, painting to music. The space between the notes is very important. And the negative space or the left out open space in a canvas, you know, sometimes we have a tendency to overlay too much. And at times you do overlay a lot, but in some of these works, you leave that open space and it, it does a lot. It's not empty. Thank you for that comment because I think the space is so important. And uh, paintings are musical to me. I think Kandinsky thought that as well, actually. But uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this is a, a show at Walter Wixier Gallery in Chelsea. Um, and I showed three large works here. Uh, it, it was great. I just wanted to show the scale of the work again. Then the pandemic hit um, and we took off for Elkins, West Virginia, where my husband's family lived and he grew up. Very small town, very interesting to be here in the hills of West Virginia. Um, but I was given the whole basement to use as my studio. And I just started creating massive amounts of small works, which I never really have done. I usually just work very big, maybe a small work here and there. Um, so I have had a great time um, using this environment and sort of getting inspired by this environment. But I noticed I didn't have house paint. So I started using palette knives a lot. Um, and I started creating this work that was much tighter and very colorful, but only with palette knives. And it was a really interesting challenge for me. And I also am interested in all over work, sort of like, I love Jackson Pollock's um, white light uh, painting, if you, if, if you know that. It's, it's, just, it's just all 
paint, like thick, thick paint all together, all over the canvas, no space. Um, so I was interested in playing with this concept. Um, this one's called Wild Garden. Um, my mother-in-law has a beautiful garden in the back. All the flowers started popping up. And you know, I've been in the city for so long. <laughs> I forgot that that actually happened <laughs> outside. <laughs> um, so it was really, uh, it really inspired me. Uh, then we moved to uh, coastal Massachusetts for a few months uh, where I summer, summered every summer and I got another studio. You can see those fishing rods behind me. You know, I just set up a corner in, in like the shed garage area, but it was fantastic. You could see the ocean and I could let my paintings dry outside on the grass and the sun. And my work started opening up a lot. Um, this one's called Bonfire. This one's called Ocean. I, I love this environment and this place. The ocean's um, so intense and the environment's so beautiful. Uh, this is called Journey to the Center of the Earth on the left. This is called Passage on the right. Um, and I was using house paint again, so I felt right at home. I took my work, uh, some of my 16 by 20 pieces to the water and set up a photo shoot. And you can just see how, how bright they are against the, the rocks, but I thought it was a very interesting juxtaposition, juxtaposition just like nest on the roof in Brooklyn. And these are, these are some works I've been working on since I've been back in West Virginia. Again, I've done about 70 works since last March, all small works. Uh, and uh, you can see there's a couple different styles. There's this hard gestural marks. There's the house paint style with a lot of space in between. There's this palette knife style. Um, and I'm just ex exploring it all. And thank you. And please look at, Follow me on Instagram and check out my website. And it's a pleasure being on here. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much. I found it interesting how you documented most things through the various studios you had. Um, and yes, studios influence you, obviously, the cities and the states that you were in. But it was nice the way you really tied everything to your studio. I do want to read a few things. Uh, um, Jenna Lair says your colorful, colorfully designed paintings make an exciting contrast to the dark of the New York City cityscape. Um, and I thought of the pieces that you put out at the beach. And I think there's more to mine in that. We showed uh, Good Naked Gallery uh, twice here. And they take art. They put it in parks and they integrate it with trees. It's not just propped up. They sort of work with the environment. Yes, it's ephemeral, it doesn't last, but it's something more for you to play with there if you want to take it on. <clears throat> it's to sort of bring your work into nature. Um, uh, and Life asks, and Leith, um, have you tried working on anything but canvas surfaces? You've obviously move through various materials, um, tools like palette knives um, and use objects, but are you strictly working on canvas? Or I think she's making the point, you have options to go on different materials, whether it's to become truly three-dimensional and work on rocks and objects like that or whatever it is. But I think she's, uh, her question opens a door for you if you wanna go through it. Um, Larry says, I like your bonfire. Um, I, I think I think it might be your best piece. Uh, Fran Beeler, excellent presentations tonight. She has to leave a little bit earlier. And Carol Arita asks, how do you think your work changed since the pandemic? Well, it got a lot smaller, first of all. <laughs> um, I started using palette knives a lot more. Um, and I th think a lot of it felt very squeezed. I think there was a lot of anxiety at that time. And you can sort of see that come out in my early, the early pandemic work. And then it sort of subsides a little bit um, as, as we move through the year and I change to a different studio and then come back here. Um, but it, it was like, a, it was a bit of a struggle to paint in that first bit of time because of all the anxiety and, and change. And as you may, all may know, when you move studios, it takes a while to acclimate to the new studio. 
So there's always that factor as well. And uh, I liked the other comment about color being in the city because yes, the city is so gray and, um, and I had this dark basement um, studio and that really drove me to paint even brighter, you know, <laughs> to paint as bright as I could because I was combating the darkness. And I also love bright colors and I love 80s stuff. And, you know, I just, I love all that stuff. So um, it's, it's always fun for me to paint in that, in, with the, that color palette. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much. Great presentation. And I think we're seeing interesting contrast in the artists that have presented here. Our next artist, Susan Kaprov. Um, Susan, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Everybody, thanks. As I predicted, we are going over. Uh, it's very rare we go under, even though I only highlighted three artists. Keep in mind, we're the artist talk on art. We're here every Monday. If you like what you see, spread the word. If you want to do a talk, reach out to me. I can either put you in with other people we have coming or you can organize a talk if you'd like to contribute. The information's on our website. You can always reach out with any questions. So Susan, where are you coming in from? Um, I live in Brooklyn Heights. I've been here for a very long time. Um, I uh, used to have a studio, but then uh, it was converted into co-ops in the six figures. So I got very politely evicted. So I'm right now during the pandemic, I'm working from home and <laughs> uh, I too have gotten a, a lot smaller, but I'd like to, I wanted to present my work in a kind of playful way uh, because I work, um, I, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, but I, I don't have a signature style as such. I, um, I try, I, I'm, I'm a thematic and stylistic explorer and you know we have so few freedoms in life for me my art is really an expression of whatever freedom I can I can um, collect and express myself through it's with my art so let me let me um, open up the I, I did a PowerPoint presentation I think you froze, Susan. I was gonna say we had no technical difficulties. Something must be wrong here today. And there we go. Uh, Susan, if you can hear me, you may want to, uh, I know we practiced this and it worked. Um, you may wanna jump off and jump back on um, or uh, Lawrence, maybe you know a good way to get out of this loop. Nothing I can think of. This seems like a uh, like she lost the, the signal entirely. Oh, she did the right thing actually by just jumping off of uh, screen sharing. Um, let me see if she is on in the group. Um, if if you're going to um, email her, perhaps uh, and or she if she can hear me, or I can type it in, or somebody else can type faster <laughs> just to, to quit the app, come back up again. Exactly. I, I have a feeling she jumped off. And so if we just wait a minute, um, I think she'll come back on. It's almost like we're in the same room again. <laughs> yes. So do keep in mind, if anybody ever wants to present, you can reach out to me and do spread the word. Um, as you can see, everybody's comments really opens up the dialogue. It opens up the artist. I think even when, uh, when uh, Jessica spoke, if you noticed, you know, she mentioned uh, the early work, how she set up objects and combined them. Uh, uh, Jessica, when you started to show some of the works that you were doing, I don't know if these were the college works or after, you used a teddy bear and you were using objects uh, and putting it into your work. I always ask that question because I feel, you know, an artist is, an, is very similar to the artist they were when they were a little kid. And so often those themes carry through 
although they get evolved in ways. Certainly, Jessica, your work went through lots of transformations, uh, just as Emma's did. And that's very nice to see. And you, you are searching and you are evolving. And you, you certainly have moved away from objects to almost a pure abstraction, um, if that is at all possible. But it, it seems like you, you really have uh, made a stab at it. I'm still not very object obsessed, but in my photography. Okay. Not, not in the painting anymore. Painting is its own, its own, you know, personality now, its own baby. <laughs> and yes, to what you said, uh, you know, you constantly mention things like, uh, I was pregnant, I followed my husband to London, I uh, had to go ahead and, uh, oh, Kath, can you bring me that? I had to go ahead and, uh, um, you know, the different things you have to do take time. So whether you had to work in design and things like that, bear with me, this is the call. Hi. I'm, I'm so sorry, my computer crashed, it's booting up. It's booting up. All right, so we'll keep, we're chatting. We're all talking about you here. Okay. Okay, and when it, when it goes back on, just hop back on, we'll put you on. Okay, okay. great, thank you. So I think we, we all have the constraints of our lives, obviously to make money, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it obviously interferes, uh, but that, that's the nature of life. There are very few people like Monet that actually win the lottery and then can buy Givernet and sit and paint. So it, it is a, uh, it's, it, it's a very different world for all of us. And uh, I applaud you for sort of doing the day job and then running to the studio. We all know how hard that can be um, and tiring. And certainly a lot of your energy has been spent on your day job. So it is challenging. It is, but I, I like to think that they always informed each other. Um, my painting was my sort of free form, but it would, it would keep me creatively on my toes uh, for my graphic design job. And, and vice versa, the design job was so structured that when I finally got to the studio, I really felt like I wanted to just be very loose. Um, so they did inform each other quite well, in, in my life anyway. Yeah, myself, I've always, I, you know, for most of my life I had one job, but since that ended, I've done a lot of different jobs, including finance. And when I was in finance, I did works that were like abstract graphs of financial analysis. And when I worked at a flower shop, maybe my work got a little floral. And I, I, I think you're right. Whatever you do in your day job can influence you in a very good way. And uh, it's fun to see how that comes out. Um, Michael, what have you been up to? Can I just ask Jessica something? Well, you know, it's interesting. Today they had William Ketteridge on uh, Brooklyn Rail. Into, uh, on a, you know, his, that he talked on Brooklyn Rail today. And he, talked, he was talking about how his studio um, gave him the space to, to find the thing that he wasn't looking for. So he said that, you know, yeah, he knew, he knew what he wanted to do, but the studio itself, the environment of the studio gave him the stuff on the edges and the stuff on the edges would give him direction that he didn't have before. I thought that was kind of an interesting take on what a studio, this you, Jessica was mentioning that a studio influences your work, but he was talking about how it like, it changes the, like you'll do something in the studio or you'll see one project against another and it'll lead to something else. So I think kind of interesting. Hey, Barry, can I ask uh, Jessica a question? Of course, Larry, go ahead. Uh, Jessica, um, you're in the graphic world. Who are your summer, your graphic icons that you look up to? Oh my gosh. Um, well, um, you know, I always love Milton Glacier. Well, uh, you the top of the mountain. <laughs> The Vignelli, uh, the Vignelli and Associates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's a there's a church they designed that she designed actually on fifty something and third. And I've right. always wanted to go in it. I don't know if any of you have ever been in there, mm -hmm. um, but it just looks so beautiful. But they, you know, they did the Bloomingdale's logo and the subway map, and 
just amazing, amazing stuff that we see every day and that's iconic and timeless. Um, one, of, uh, one of Milton's greatest pieces, I think, and then everybody's going to say, oh, yeah, I love New York, yep, aside from that, is um, he did a poster for Bob Dylan, where yes. Bob Dylan, and that to me may be the epitome of the simplicity of Milton Glaser's thinking. Yes. Pure graphic design at its best. I know that poster and I have it. It's amazing. <laughs> you own the poster? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I want to, yeah, also I want to say that uh, he was very generous. No yes. one a genius, but he, he had a house in Woodstock, New York, and he uh, was spending weekends and summers in Woodstock and collaborated with the community, donating posters, design for art studios, tours, and donated these to the Woodstock Artists Association. He yeah, was great. Very, a genius and generous man, really, very really generous. generous. Very generous. I, do I, know took, that. Um, I took a class with him called a Design and Personality. And he would take uh, personality traits. I see people nodding their head. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like we had to make one week, we had to come up with an invention. And, you know, he would just take different themes every week and, and it, it was, it really made you think a lot. Wow. Yeah, he was a brilliant, um, uh, the word is, I'm looking for is, he saw things that were obvious that others didn't even know existed. That's, That's great, right. Well, the, <clears throat> great the way to, to summarize in graphic design is to, to be simple and, and profound. Yes. He, had a, he had that, you know, the way just to express something that we can all understand, but profoundly designed, really a genius. And yeah, I want to say, I, sorry, Larry, I want to say to Jessica that the way that I see your face when you talked about your work, you look like that girl with the crayons. I was observing your the way that you are expressing about your painting, beautiful colors and that energy that you put to talk about your work. You look like that, uh, that girl with the crayons. I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I love hearing that. <laughs> My work is like life. It's, it, it's like life it, itself to me. It's a metaphor. So I love hearing. Thank you. <laughs> Susan, can you uh, hear me? yes, That's we can good. hear you. Do you want to? Uh, thanks for coming back on. Do you want sure. to try and screen share? Thanks everybody for being patient. I really appreciate that. Okay. Last time. Emma, you're burning the midnight oil there, Emma. You're at past one, you're at 1.30, correct? Uh, yes, it appears to be, but we do stay up late here pretty normally, so it's not out of the realm of my reality. <laughs> yes. Hey, hey, I got it. Okay. I'm just gonna sort of open up. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, I want to just open up and bring people into my process of thinking. I'm basically a conceptual artist. I don't have a signature style as such, but as I, as you see the work that I do, you'll see a connecting thread. Um, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I have a lot of play in my work. Um, I work in series and I'm a thematic and stylistic ad adventure uh, I, I, I see it as a kind of adventure. Um, I tend to gravitate um, towards experimentation and avoiding allegiance, uh, uh, avoiding allegiance to current trends. I feel there's a lot of pressure to do things that address politics, but that's not for me. Um, I see my studio as a laboratory and my art as a series of research projects. So let me just 
I grew up in the Bronx, not far from the Yankee Stadium. And I was so close to the stadium that when anybody hit a home run, we would hear the roar of the crowd. Now, I've only been to two baseball games in my entire life. I'm sorry to say. So when I needed a break, where did I go? Where did I go? I went to museums. I went to galleries. I escaped from a rather tumultuous family background. Um, it was uh, difficult. I won't go into the details, but it was a hard, I had a very hard life. Um, I'm not playing the violin. I came out okay. I came out intact. But uh, the museums of New York were the saving grace. And <clears throat> when I looked at those paintings, I knew I was someday going to be an artist. I just knew it. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. How I was going to do this, I don't know. These were my friends, all of my friends. And, you know, I, I see all these paintings and I, I wanted to live in them. I wanted them to be giant stages where I could actually build a home and, and be there. I wanted to go to Tahiti, which was a terrible, wretched place when Gauguin was there. And, you know, as a woman, it would be very hard to live the life of a single woman going to a place like that and just setting up, <laughs> setting up an easel and painting. But I wanted that state of mind. I realized it wasn't where people were, it was their state of mind at where they were. So what does it really mean to be an artist? I get up, I go to, you know, I have my breakfast, I, you know, talk to uh, my friends, I talk to, um, my partner, my boyfriend, what does it mean to be an artist? What does it mean to be creative? And everything begins with an idea, some idea with me. Um, it begins with a, a concept. What do I want to do next? What do I want to do next? The, the scariest thing is looking at a blank canvas. I'll do anything I feel like doing. I have a very free and a very restless um, artistic temperament. Um, so, as I said, I use my, my studio as a laboratory. My art is a series, series is really important of research projects. And most of all, I enjoy taking risks. Um, curators seem to like that approach. Art dealers have more of a difficulty with it because of my lack of a, 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 a completely recognizable signature style. I see it's recognizable and more and more, I think other people are too. Here's where it all started. Seriously, I have to say seriously, my, um, my penchant for experimentation was with um, Halloid Xerox machines and uh, plain office copies where I used to work as a freelance photo researcher for publishing companies. And I experimented with the machines. I mean, I was just a kid having fun. Um, I didn't realize that a couple of decades later, the Whitney Museum would um, purchase uh, 16 of this series. Everybody laughed at them. I laughed at them. I thought they were really kind of um, flippant and not very serious, but I was wrong. I didn't see what I was doing. Other people had to tell me what I was doing. Uh, these are all self-portraits. Um, I used my body, but very in a very limited way, uh, just my face and my hands sometimes. This one was done um, taking a piece of white paper, cutting a hole in it and sticking my tongue and my, and my uh, hand. Um, and that one's in the Whitney too. They really loved this one. They thought it was very funny. I thought it was funny too at the time I did it. This one uh, is at the Museum of Modern Art. They, they uh, acquired that one. I tell you, this was all an amazing thing to me uh, because I, I didn't take it seriously. And I know now as an artist, when I feel something that I don't quite know what I'm doing, I know I'm doing the right thing. That's just for me. Come on, go next. Don't. Yeah, this is another um, color Xerox uh, photo montage based in scientific um, uh, <clears throat> uh, scientific images, um, uh, colliders, uh, particle colliders, and astronomy. 
I uh, majored in biology, by the way. I don't have an art background. I took art courses, but I don't have an art background. I have a science background, actually. So I'm very, um, I, I, I don't see any um, inherent uh, conflict between the two. In fact, there are many artists that merge the two very beautifully. Uh, so I do that. And um, this one is in my own collection. I happen to like this one. This one is in the uh, Whitney's collection. This is completely abstract. Uh, the color Xeroxes uh, that I used, <clears throat> excuse me, um, have three passes. And if you move on the glass as they pass, you get uh, this array of um, overlapping and overlays that uh, can be quite beautiful. I used, uh, fortunately I used rag paper. I didn't use the cheap Xerox paper, so they, they uh, were very preserved using this kind of paper. This one is in the Munson Proctor Williams Institute in Utica. I, I know someone mentioned that this great, it's a great, it's a small museum, but it packs a wallop. And this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, it's called Imprint. And uh, they're all um, 13 by 17, pretty much all these um, experimental things that I did early on in my career. Um, I, you I, know, I, say, I do want to say, Susan, it's very interesting how your work started off and it shows us a relationship to Emma's work, certainly the mm -hmm. figure and the way you used it. You're using what we might call simple technology, the Xerox. I want to point out mm -hmm. Andy Warhol loved the Xerox machine as well. So yeah. you get, get on, there is some magic to this sort of multiple or the ability to put your face in it and get something. So it, again, it's simple, but it's complicated. And then at the same time, you're moving to color plays and you're moving to abstraction, which is quite like, uh, um, sorry there, Jessica Krauss-Smith is doing. So like I always like to point out, there's no plan often in the artists that come together, but there always will be a consilience. There always will be links between artists. Um, Lawrence Wheatman points out, uh, art and science are the same thing. Indeed, we could have an hour long discussion on that. Yes, but very no, similar. But yes, there's no <laughs> question. And life says, these are cool, Susan. Um, and I'll, I'll let you continue. Sorry to interrupt, just wanted to- No, that's okay, thank you. I appreciate the feedback. Uh, the art and science, the same brain power that goes into making a really good aesthetic decision uh, is the same brain power that goes into making a scientific decision. You have to always improve what you've done. You have to always go after the next um, uh, the next level of uh, inquiry. For me, my art is an inquiry, not so much as a grouping, but as an inquiry. What I want to show you next um, is that I am stimulated by both the natural and man-made worlds, and they all, they often combine and merge. Um, I, I'm very fascinated by the macro, the, the large and the very small. And I, I travel a lot and um, I see things that, that, that are related to one another. I just wanted to show everybody here how I think and what moves me. I much prefer the natural world, which is rapidly disappearing. This is one of my favorite images. Spirals are the most beautiful things in the world. And I think, Barry, you said something, a circle is kind of flat, but a circle is considered very spiritual, though, in, in the East. Like, um, uh, I think they see everything uh, as a circular evolution. This is, uh, just wanted to get some images together to um, show you uh, the, um, the... And of course, you know, in, in the spirals you showed, there's the Fibonacci pattern is inside oh, that yeah. is nature, but you have very, much. very hard math right inside there. I don't know any of the formulas. I just know some of the concepts. I was married to a physicist for a very long time. He passed away not that long ago. And uh, I mean, we would talk quantum theory at breakfast. I mean, that kind of thing. It was like, we could do, you know, we could just get into it. So I got into it and these are, white light drawings. These were shown at the planetarium about 10 years ago. Um, they're gouache over a black board. So it's not uh, black over white, it's white over black, which I consider really exciting. Here's another uh, duo. There are eight, there are 12 of these all together, but I, I only show 
uh, I'm only showing you four. And of course, Van Gogh was a huge influence. All these, um, you know, this motion. Uh, I always want to impart a sense of energy to my work. Um, these are computer ge uh, generation uh, generated designs. I love graphic design. And very often I've been told that my painting, my work is a combination, my artwork is a combination of painting and graphic design. So these uh, uh, can be enlarged um, and actually produced uh, at just about any size. I'm waiting to get the opportunity to um, you know, continue to make them very large. I, I did one installation um, where I took the digital image. That's the one, that's one of the ones um, I, I did a visualization, you'll see. You know, and again, there's a lot of layering. There's a lot of, um, uh, I guess you could say conflict. Uh, somebody told me once that there, that my work looked like a, an epic battle. This is a visualization. Uh, this was supposed to start last year and the pandemic ruined the whole thing. It was supposed to be in the World Trade Center Paths uh, train. I won a finalist, um, I, uh, I won a finalist commission. I want to show everybody here how my studio work segues into my um, commissioned art. Uh, it's very hard to convince people uh, to accept that because commissioned art has its own set of restrictions. Whereas in my studio, I can do anything I want. So I try to um, try to convince them that there's really no difference. Now this one um, was, uh, it's called Oath. And uh, this was uh, on exhibition at the National Museum of American Art. It's a, um, dye sublimation on aluminum. And it's in their collection too. Really came out well. Uh, I had a, people fabricate it and a collector of mine uh, financed it. I can't afford this. I mean, it's expensive stuff, but it all worked out. I mean, it's a good thing I make a living from my art because I'm completely unemployable anyway. So, I mean, no one's gonna hire me to do anything. I can't do anything else. Um, I can't, it's not that I refuse, I just can't. You might say I'm a little compulsive, but so on. Everybody's compulsive. Any, anybody who's an artist who has a, mu a muse, we're all. This is another installation that I have proposed to a number of places. Um, it does not exist, but these works do exist in digital form. So I work very large and I work very small. Um, these are a series of uh, pastel and mixed media uh, works on paper. And I, I don't date my work unless I'm forced to by um, a curator for a museum uh, who wants to acquire my work, then I give them the dates, but I don't see my work as any kind of progression. I don't see any progression as such in my work at all. Um, I just uh, see, see the work as a continuing kind of fluidity uh, and a conceptual fluidity uh, with using different mediums. Here's another one. You know, well, see, seeing these works, um, both the futurists come to mind. You get movement, oh, yeah. you get energy. and I, I love them. And also the Russian uh, avant-garde around 1915 to 1925. I myself, I, I'm familiar with it now because I'm collaging from the book. Yeah. But you know, you're obviously a lot more colorful than they are, but these do read like collages in a way. Um, well, no, actually they're not. They're uh, pastels and uh, they're totally improvised. I mean, I don't uh, do a drawing uh, or I don't make the shapes. I just totally improvise. In fact, I had a bag full of pastels. I dipped into the bag, whatever came out, that's what went on the paper. I love doing stuff like that. I mean, I love experimenting and I, I, I like the idea of randomness. I mean, you know, um, I, I talk about randomness with mathematicians, uh, you know, and before they go into a completely abstract ex, uh, explanation of it, uh, I like the unpredictability of, of working in a way that I just simply don't know what's going to happen. It's anxiety provoking, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, but well, also, is, if, you, if you know where you're going, you'll achieve that. If on the other hand, you're open, 
you can sometimes achieve more than if you really had a plan. Now, no, I have no plan, Barry. Yeah. No plan at all. No, and I sense that. And I, I, I'm saying that could be, you know, it's up to the artist to choose what they want. But sometimes, you know, going with the flow, going for the random, mm -hmm. picking out a color, not knowing what it is, seeing it, and then having to make a mark somewhere where it works, that's a great challenge. And, you know, I, I sense Mondrian knew what he was going to put down when he laid down his yeah. angles. Um, but that doesn't mean that's the formula. Op often the opposite formula works just as well and maybe is even a little more creative. And I see yeah. you tapped into that. I, I agree. And I, I, I do love the Russian avant-garde. Um, I, I love their uh, complete fearlessness, just total fearlessness. And yet, of course, they did a lot of political work, but in their graphic design and in their concepts, I mean, I can look at that stuff all day long. Elizitsky, uh, Rachenko, um, Poonin, uh, some of the women who, who participated were extraordinary. And then Kandinsky was on the cusp of it. And I love Kandinsky, I love his work. Oh, here's a, um, a hanging jacquard tapestry that was uh, uh, fabricated from one of the, um, what I call allegory of the senses. That's just a you know nice title. I thought it was poetic that I made up. And uh, uh, jacquard tapestry is a, a wonderful medium. I've never worked in it. I don't do them. I have them fabricated by a company. So um, this was uh, New York Law School. It's on a different floor since COVID began. I'm not sure where it is, but it, it it's, uh, was very well received. It's very large. And um, I did a group of things uh, with jigsaw puzzles with kids. This I. Um, I took the puzzle apart, gave uh, all the pieces a number on the back, and I didn't know where they were going to be put together. So I painted them without knowing where they were. In other words, I did not interfere with the end result. And I figured, wasn't well, this a cool idea? And I got to know John Cage because we shared the same crooked accountant. And that's where I met him. I met him uh, at my accountant's office. He's gone now, so he won't mind. And I invited him over and he said, you, you, you just throw the dice out all the time. Just continue to do it. I said, okay. And I said, asked him how. He said, I'm not gonna tell you how, you just do it. Throw the dice out, see where it lands. And that's what I've been doing with just about everything. Here's a black and white one I called uh, Labyrinth in, in black and white. All of these uh, pieces were painted without any knowledge of where they fit in the final analysis. Isn't that like life? You don't know where you're gonna fit. And the ones that you think are so uh, beautifully painted fade in the background and the ones that look kind of dull pop right out. Isn't that like life? At least I see it that way. Also, right. Susan, it's like what Emma was doing with her exquisite corp. Which yeah, taking very three similar. Different parts. Um, I do wanna read some of the com comments. Uh, uh, Francine Kornfeld, a board member of the ATOA, says, marvelous presentation, Susan, well worth waiting for. Jenna Lash, you have a unique, and, a unique and fascinating voice. You definitely do, and it's definitely worth waiting for. Eloise Pomfret points out, Sci Art Initiative is a great platform for art inspired by science and very mm -hmm. interesting work. And I will point out in, the, in some of the hardcore uh, engineering fields, they like to reach for artists as programmers because as an artist, you think mm -hmm. a little creatively and that sort of feeds your ability to do certain programming. So there is this balance where the creative mind feeds the scientific and vice versa. So- uh, Oh, please. I'm very uh, stimulated by science. I, I love science. I subscribe to all kinds of news feeds and I read about it. But I'm not, I'm not a trained scientist, although I majored in biology. Uh, I just, I'm able to read some of the journals that I get and I enjoy them immensely, especially physics and quantum theory, string theory, which nobody understands. So I don't feel so bad about that. This is another one I call Shanghai Glows. This is more of a static uh, piece. The, these are pretty big. Uh, this is 40 by 50. Uh, I get uh, puzzles, uh, blank puzzles, uh, I make, uh, I get them made to order and uh, I um, just paint over them. 
and put numbers on the back so I know I can't put them together. I mean, I wouldn't know where they go. So um, I get uh, large pieces that children can, can put together. And this is one of my, this uh, I own. This is uh, called Mandala for the 21st century. It's about uh, 50 inches in diameter. It's made for five and six year olds. It's a floor pu uh, puzzle and it's made out of wood and it's mounted on a uh, white uh, wooden board. I mean, a kind of, um, not wooden, I don't forget what it is, Sintra, I think. And um, again, uh, every single piece was uh, painted separately and did, I had no idea where it was gonna go. And some of the uh, juxtapositions uh, amazed me. They, they're much better that I didn't know rather than fuss with that, put that next to this one and that one next to the other one. I figured out what the hell with it. I'm just gonna put them down, see where they go and just leave it alone. And that's always the best way. The, the, the less I fool with this stuff, this random stuff, the better it is. You know, that, that, that piece makes me think a little bit about Damien Hirst spin artwork, but I think yours, oh, yeah. yours is a little more interesting. And, you know, when I see it, I think like, couldn't you actually put a point in the center, have those be three discs and activate them and sort of spin them? Yes, yes, like playing spin the bottle with, um, with, with puzzles. I love puzzles, I really do. I, I think I include the one I did at uh, the Modern. I did a puzzle, no. Yeah, this is how I envision it. Uh, if I ever do it, it would be uh, porcelain on steel. You know, it's really funny what photography does and how it interacts with memory. I've shown this on my website. I say it's a visualization, but people swear that they have seen the real thing. I mean, that alone is fascinating. But I say, no, it doesn't exist. It, it, it doesn't exist. It, well, I thought I saw it. Well, they didn't. You know, our, our memory doesn't know how to differentiate between things we've seen and things we've thought we've seen. It actually, right. it actually comes together as we look back on it in future time. So you're definitely right. <laughs> so um, I wanted to uh, show um, the uh, event uh, the interactive event that I conducted at the Museum of Modern Art. They have several of my pieces and I propose this. This is um, a, um, an artisan cutting out puzzle pieces. Come on, I don't wanna end the show. There we go. Um, this was for adults and children that um, about 50 people had one of these large puzzle pieces that were blank and they could do anything they wanted with it. And they didn't know where the puzzle was going to go. It's called a community puzzle. And it was, I mean, it was a near riot. It was really fun to do. And, um, you know, we had kids as young as five and we had people as old as 75 participating in this. A lot of parents came. We had to take, um, uh, on a, we had to select participants on a lottery basis, which was uh, really fun to do. And so what happened was finally it was assembled and people had a little trouble finding their piece because it was all uh, done uh, spontaneously. It was a lot of fun. A friend of mine took a photograph, um, big cheer went up and every, when, when it was done and they were able to take their pieces home. And that was fun too. I love to play with, with uh, stuff. I love to play with art. And, and I love to do work with kids. Uh, although this is the only time that's ever happened. The innocence is great. Now, <clears throat> I got a uh, commission. I, um, I won a, a commission to do a big uh, 55 foot long glass piece at um, Polytechnic Institute of NYU, which is in downtown Brooklyn. And this is the finished work. It's glass that is all scientific in, uh, images in a kind of montage. Um, a lot of them are abstract, a lot of them are not. This sort of um, is a kind of urban feeling. And this is a bridge and construction and um, Mandelbrot uh, um, images, uh, 
let me see if I have a detail. I think I included a detail of, you know, as a reference to biology here, DNA, just sort of very loose. Um, the grid you see is actually a, a steel frame where each piece of glass is um, adhered to, a, to the wall and also set in the glass frame. This is pretty big. This is uh, this sample, this um, detail is about nine feet long and about six feet high. It's very colorful. And I thought I'd put some figures in it to give it a little humanity. And, um, you know, you have all kinds of scientific images and grid work and people can, you know, just walk from one end of it to the other. It's been very successful. People, I get, I still, this is, this is not a new piece and I still get um, inquiries about it. This is a kiln. Um, that's how the digital design is translated onto glass and then fired at about 1600 degrees. It's quite a, um, I had to go to Munich to do this. This is me inspecting some of the glass panels. They're not complete yet. It took about nine months. I spent about three of those months, months in uh, Munich, which was a lot of fun. I, I didn't really, um, uh, I wasn't looking forward to going there. Uh, I couldn't tell my family because uh, I lost family in the Holocaust, although I never knew these people. So I told them I went to Italy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they found out that I was in Germany. It was okay. I really um, made friends there. And the fabricator is Meyer of Munich. And he was um, wonderful. It was a very interesting experience. This is looking at some of the pieces on the floor. Uh, the team is a whole team of people, artisans, that did this. It was quite a, quite a commission and a really excellent group of uh, fabricators. This is a, a, a piece. I, yeah. Am I going on too long? Oh, you, 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 you're doing fine. I do want to point out. Look at where you come from being raised near Yankee Stadium. <laughs> I mean, that that really is a testament to you. You've done all this and you, you realize all the different materials you took us through, you know, going to Munich to work in glass, you know, you mentioned it's in the Whitney, it's at MoMA, you know, this is a real credit. You know, and I will say, I don't discuss quantum mechanics at breakfast, that's strictly for brunch or lunch. <laughs> I find that impressive. Uh, I'd like to point out uh, Francine Kornfeld, a board member of the ATOA, asked Susan, is this lit up from behind? No, no. Uh, actually, uh, let me show you the, the here. Here's the finished piece. No, it's front lit. You can see the, um, can, you can see the uh, lights. It, well, you can't see them. Then I guess they're not lit up. I don't know. It was a very hard piece to photograph, but it, it is not backlit. And basically, uh, I took uh, photographs of the Port Authority's own photographic archive and did montages with them. Um, and I had to uh, put them in a, some kind of um, non-random way. Uh, so I call it Precambrian Waltz. Why? Because a waltz is three-quarter time, and I use primary colors, blue, red, and yellow. But each area has... Um, references to the other colors. The red has blue and yellow, the blue has red, the yellow has red and blue. So I wanted to give it this um, uh, impression of motion and interconnection, also transportation. Uh, the Port Authority, as you all know, is all about transportation. And okay. um, this is in their lobby. Again, Susan, you went ahead, you took uh, some previous work and you did a mashup, you combined it in a different way. And it's gotta make me think of Emma and the work that she did where she took some earlier poses and then she transformed them. Um, mm -hmm. Often art is a combination of something previously put together in a different way. And that applies to music. Some of the new oh, music very much so. formats are just combinations of things, two things from the past that we never thought to combine. Indeed, science maybe uses that as well. I will say, if anybody wants, Lawrence Wheatman is your man. He understands string, string theory, he tells us. And it's not uncommon when uh, 
when uh, Einstein's theory of relativity came out for about 40 years, the line was there were only six people on the planet that understand it. And certainly <laughs> the string theory is a little complicated as well. Um, well I, a lot of people think it's kind of baloney-ish, but I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Well, the, way know. Think, the way to think of it is think of it as a, uh, a tube or a string and the membrane on the outside is sort of the uh, three-dimensional wrapping and think yeah. of it as a violin string vibrating. So it's sort of like embedded, embedded dimensions that mm -hmm. you get to see just the membrane of, sort of like maybe the analogy is in this world, um, we see the surface of things, but underneath there's a lot more. So what's vibrating and interacting and producing the surface is a lot more complicated, but we can't really access it. But there is this uh, sort of inside the one dimension or uh, the limited dimension of a string, there's a lot more dimensions embedded inside of it, if that makes well, sense. Well, it's all very fascinating because the, um, the world we navigate in is really run by quantum theory, only we can't experience it. We can only experience the macro or the large you know, material world that we, um, that, that, we, that we live in. It's like the sting song, you know, in the material world. I, I forget the name of it, but everybody knows he saying um, that that's the, th those are the words he used, the material world. So I, um, I, I'm really fascinated with all this, but I, I also want to express how I seem to fit in or I look at it. I, I want to explore it. I want to stretch the boundaries. Oh, these are um, digital uh, photo montages based on uh, actual plants and flowers. And I love symmetry. Um, nature, for the most part, is symmetrical, although there are many different types of symmetry. I love the idea of, of exploiting the symmetry in nature to produce um, designs made out of um, botanical images. So I went out and I bought all these flowers and uh, photographed them and then um, uh, merged them in Photoshop. This is one of my favorite ones. Alyssa Pritzker says, Susan, your art travels perfectly from your first copies to your last pieces that you were showing us. I think what she's expressing, she sees the connectedness in your art, even if the art dealers do not. Carol Orito points out, it's your work is like a neurotransmission in a synapse. <laughs> Very nice analogy. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a glass wall piece that I did for the uh, Orlando Regional Healthcare System. It was a commission. It's, this, this one is backward. And um, this one I actually did in uh, someone else's studio. I don't know where this is gonna go. Uh, I traded art for fabrication services with a um, photographic studio. It's part of a, um, a series that I did called Gardens and Galaxies where I put the very small next to the very large. And it, 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 I actually, I, I can see the, there is a connection. I can see it in this presentation that there is a connection uh, throughout all my work. So it's really nice giving this. I, I find it interesting. And I always feel a sense of detachment from my work. Um, you know, that uh, I find, I, I find a little disconcerting, but I, I have such a strong urge to create. I just go on to the next thing. This is a, um, uh, a visualization of a mosaic that uh, I won a commission for, but uh, when Hurricane Sandy came along, the entire station had to be rebuilt and it wasn't built with this plat with this uh, wall. So that was the end of that. But it would be nice to, to have it built and fabricated a glass mosaic in concrete. I did make samples of it, so I know it can work. But um, I think they're still working on it actually. Hurricane Sandy is almost uh, 10 years old. Susan, can we wrap it up with a few yeah. more? I do want to point out, Larry said, I find some of the images similar to the nebula in our galaxy. I think you're right to see 
the macro and the micro coming together, as you showed us. There's that fa famous line, as above, so below. Not sure oh, sure. Not sure if it's Aristotle. I think everybody takes credit for that line. Oh, but, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm just about done. Yeah, this is a billboard that I did near Cape Cod, Save the Planet. You can see the ocean, Cape Cod Bay, I think. Oh, this is a piece that I did for um, the um, federal courthouse in Florida called Swimmers, going in opposite directions. This curtain wall glass, kind of um, a uh, reference to scales of justice swimming by. And this is a video still from some, I, um, a commission that I did for the Carver Hawkeye Arena in Iowa City. It's for their uh, sports arena, but this is still, you can find this on my, you can find it on my website. You can see the video. And um, this is part of a series called The Dense City a few years ago. And uh, this was uh, exhibited in the mezzanine gallery at Lincoln Center for a while. That's backlit. Audrey Anastasi asks, do you have a studio or is your work mostly in files on your computer until it's fabricated? Oh, most of it uh, is in digital files and printouts on various uh, medium, but a lot of it is digital. I'm gonna have to um, do something about that in terms of preserving it. I know that there are people who uh, know about this. I have an arts lawyer who's uh, going to guide me with that. I have thousands of images, literally thousands of them. Um, but not everything is digital. Uh, there are a lot of things that aren't. This one was from a digital file, but that actually exists. So you can I may, tell you? You may want to make some NFTs out of some of these. <laughs> There's a lot of money. You got to invest a lot of money to do that. Yeah, and anyway, it's- You got to get them up. You got to get them up, that's right. All right, this is a commission I did for um, Kings County Hospital for the pediatric emergency uh, area, where I, the theme of flight and transportation and jumping and ballooning, you know, get the kids out of their worry, uh, especially the frog, they really love that one. And that's um, porcelain on steel, enamel paint, I'm sorry, on aluminum. This is another, uh, mural that I did for a uh, science vocational high school in Connecticut. I think I'm done. That's the um, a detail of it. That's about 10 feet long. And that's the end, folks. And that's what I say. I am not living in a dream world. Rather, a dream world is living in me. So anybody who wants to communicate with me, I'll be well, I, I find it welcome, welcoming to uh, you know, communicate, even collaboration. I would love to collaborate with another artist and dream something wild and crazy and, you know, interesting. Have some fun. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for uh, having me and to present my work. I really enjoyed it. Susan, that, that was brilliant. Everybody tonight, Emma and Jessica, wait, make sure. Emma and Jessica, yes, yeah, sorry about that. That really was brilliant, all three of you. Uh, definitely differences and similarities. I just wanna thank everybody for coming and sticking around. I knew we'd go over even with three artists. I'll do my best not to, but you, you all, the time was well spent. There's no question about it. Emma, I let you go because the work was brilliant. You know, that's the way we roll here, where there's what to be said and what to be listened to we don't have a time constraint. And those who can stay, stay. And those who can't, can. I think everybody got something out of this. Um, Emma Shapiro says, thank you all so much. Uh, Debbie Lenino, oh, thank I... you so much. Uh, uh, Michael Krasowitz says, great presentations. I think that echoes our thoughts. You all did a great job. Keep coming, spread the word. Um, if you ever want to organize something, go ahead and sort of organize something and reach out to me. Um, this was brilliant, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for being a oh, part of the- Thank story. you. It was a real treat. Really was. Nice job, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank again. You. See you next week. <laughs>